Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. In this video we will start a new topic called Kinetic Theory of Gases. Now we will start learning about temperature in a lot more detail. Up till now we know of temperature as something which tells us how hot or cold an object is. But when we go down to the microscopic level, hot and cold are meaningless quantities and all the information is contained in how the molecules move. The first and most important equation in this chapter is called the ideal gas equation. And as the name suggests, it is valid for a specific type of gas which is the ideal gas. Now this is sort of a cyclical definition because what is an ideal gas? An ideal gas is basically any gas which obeys this equation. The equation relates a few important characteristics of a gas and these characteristics are called properties of state. And properties of state is a very general concept in thermodynamics and it tells us the important things and the minimum number of things needed to basically describe the state of a particular system. For an ideal gas, the properties required to completely specify the gas are the pressure of the gas, the temperature of the gas and the volume of the gas. So if we know these three quantities for a particular amount of gas, we can calculate anything of interest theoretically and now we'll see how to do that. So the ideal gas equation is PV is equal to NRT. P is the pressure, V is the volume, T is the temperature, R is a constant called the universal gas constant. and its value is equal to 8.314 uh, units. I don't remember what the units are exactly. You can derive them very quickly. So there is another form of this equation which is PV is equal to capital N KT. With K is a constant known as the Boltzmann constant And I need to specify these two quantities as well. Small n, this is a little ambiguous. Small n is the number of moles of the gas. You know what a mole is from chemistry. A mole is basically 6 times 10 to the power 23 units. Right? So 2 moles of gas means 2 times 6 times 10 to the power 23 molecules of gas or atoms. Capital N is actually the number of particles. Right. Now, these two might confuse you, and but it's important to know the difference. I'm going to clearly explain the difference in a minute. But it's important because we have two separate forms of the ideal gas equation which are equivalent. Then why are there two forms? Because as physicists, when we study theoretical physics and we are trying to model the behavior of particles, we like to talk of one particle or three particles. But chemistry is more of an experimental science and when you are dealing in chemistry, it's hard to talk about particles because it is a more practical science. So you need to talk about moles. So you have two forms of an equation. One deals with the number of actual moles and the other deals with the number of actual particles there are. So of course P and V are the same in both, T is the same in both. So N and N have to be related by a factor such that R and K will be related by the inverse of that factor. We already know that the number of moles is a very small number and the number of moles multiplied by Na which is the number of particles in one mole, Avogadro's constant, I'm sure you know that. This is equal to the number of particles. I apologize if my small n seems a little bit like the capital N. That shouldn't happen. I'll try to work on that. 
Let's go. Okay. So small n is usually a very small number, and capital N, the number of particles, will be a very large number. If there are five moles of a gas, that means there are five times six times ten to the power twenty-three number of particles. So if small n is a very small number, r will have to be a very large number compared to this. So k has to be a very small number compared to r, and the value of k can be derived as r by n a. Right now, there's not a lot of substance going on. There's a lot of terminology, and that's because I want you to be comfortable between these two equations and know exactly what they represent. This represents the pressure and volume and temperature of a certain number of moles of a gas. This is the pressure, volume, and temperature of a certain number of particles of the gas. Since the number of particles has to be much more than the number of moles by a big factor, k has to be much much smaller than r by the same factor. This is 16 to 10 to the power 24. 6 into 10 to the power 23. I'm sorry. So, in problems, you generally will get it in terms of moles. But as a theoretical physicist, it is important to know that the particles are what make up the moles, and the particles' energies are what we are trying to study, and the particles' motion. Right. So, let me write the two equations again. P V is equal to small n capital R T. Or PV is equal to capital N KT. Small n capital N A is equal to capital N, and R is equal to K times N A. Right. So now a little bit more terminology in this itself. I'm going to write an equation, and you really need to understand this equation. It's It's important because otherwise you start getting confused about what we're talking about, right? And I got confused first when I wasn't aware of this equation, and that is small m capital N is equal to capital M is equal to m not small n. I mean, we know what small n is is the number of moles. So m not is the mass of one mole. This is important because a lot of times you'll get confused in the questions as to whether or not you need the mass of gas. If you have, if you're talking about, for example, nitrogen gas, you would know whether to take the mass as 28 or 28 into 1.667 into 10 to the power minus 27, which is the mass of one nu nucleon. Right. This is capital N. Is the number. Of particles, so small m is the mass of one particles, and m is the total mass of the gas. Right. So we are talking about the mass of the total gas which we have. We can talk about it in a number of ways. The actual total mass. the mass of one particle multiplied by the total number of particles in the gas or the mass of one mole multiplied by the total number of moles in the gas right the reason we have these two different is i already told you when we are dealing with experiments it's easier to talk about moles than particles but when we are studying it on a pen and paper then it's easier to study about particles it's easier to talk about particles than moles right so for example let's say we have Three moles of oxygen gas. That means we have m not, which is the mass of one mole, will be equal to thirty-two gram. We'll have n, which is the number of moles, which will be equal to three. So we will have capital M, which will be three times thirty-two, ninety-six grams. Small m. Will be the mass of one particle. In this case, the mass of one molecule. That is, 32 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms. Right? You want you can do this also into 10 to the power minus 3 kilograms if you wanted to say this. This is small m. What is small n? The number of particles. Sorry, capital M. The number of particles. That will be three times six point zero two three 
into 10 to the power 23. I, I know we haven't really gotten into the kinetic theory much and I apologize for that. But this is important because otherwise you'll make mistakes, especially if you're studying for entrance examinations. So a lot of the time you'll remember a formula as, uh, we'll derive these soon as, okay, the speed of a molecule is root 3 RT by M. And then you won't know what is this M. If you're talking about oxygen, is this M supposed to be 32 or 32 multiplied by 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 27? Is it the mass of one mole of oxygen? or one molecule of oxygen and of course those two answers will be widely different so when we this this is an unfortunate side effect of the fact that we talk about moles and particles but once you get the hang of it it will be easy enough i promise so m naught is the mass of one mole of a gas that is the molar mass of a gas that is 32 grams for oxygen that is uh, 28 grams for nitrogen and so on n is the number of moles of the gas capital m is the total mass of the gas you have in the container Capital N is the number of total particles in the gas, number of total atoms or molecules. Small m is the mass of one particle. Okay, so now that we've gotten all the boring part out of the way, let's move on to the interesting stuff. What is the use of this equation and when is it really valid? So, PV is equal to NRT. Right. First of all, like I said, this is only valid for ideal gases. And an ideal gas is a gas which obeys this equation. So it doesn't really seem useful, except real gases can mimic this behavior under certain special conditions. The special conditions, the closer they are to a quote-unquote ideal gas. So what is an ideal gas? If we talk about a, a substance in the spectrum of a liquid solid gas, then you have gases, you have liquids, and you have solids, right? And there's a spectrum. So, a substance which is closer to a gas will be closer to an ideal gas. A substance which is closer to a liquid will be further away from an ideal gas. And what is the difference between a liquid and gas? Ultimately, a liquid has a much higher density than a gas. In any particular unit volume, a liquid has a very high number of molecules, whereas a gas has a lower number of molecules. So, what is the characteristic of a gas or of a quote-unquote ideal gas? It's, it should have a very low number of particles in any given volume. The number of particles, as they keep on increasing, it becomes a liquid. And as they increase even further, it becomes a solid. So, a very few number of particles within a unit volume will mean it's very close to an ideal gas. The quantitative way of divide, defining that would be real gases... behave like ideal gases at low densities. If you start increasing the density of a gas, the intermolecular attractions will start increasing, it will behave more like a liquid. Right. So, the lower the density, the closer it is to an ideal gas. And for, comparative, for relatively low densities, you can use this equation without any error. So let's manipulate this equation a little bit further. We just saw that N M naught is equal to capital M, which is the total mass of the gas. Right. So N can be written as M by M naught, which means this equation is P V is equal to M by M naught R T. M is the total mass of the gas. M naught is the mass of one mole of the gas. Right. Which gives me P M naught is equal to m by v. m is the total mass of the gas, v is the total volume of the gas. So this becomes rho, the density of the gas, rt. This is another form of the equation. And again, now you have to keep in mind because this stuff becomes important. If you have 3 kilogram of oxygen, that doesn't mean this m0 will be 3 kilogram. This m0 will still be 32 grams. This m0 is the mass of 1 mole. Whenever I write m0, it is the mass of 1 mole. Whenever I write capital M, it is the total mass of the gas. And small m is the mass of 1 particle. Right? So now you see these things becoming important. This is another form of the equation. And this shows us that rho is equal to P m0 by RT. The density of a gas. M0 is obviously constant for any gas, R is a constant, so rho is proportional to P by T, which means low densities is synonymous with 
लो प्रेशर और हाई टेम्परेचर राइट सो आई आई एम ट्राइंग टू टेक यू थ्रू द कॉन्सेप्चुअल वे अलॉट ऑफ टाइम्स आई हैव सीन बुक्स एंड पीपल टीच इन अ वे इन विच दे से दैट पीवीसी को टू एनआरटी इज वैलिड फॉर लो प्रेशर एंड हाई टेम्परेचर एंड देन यू रिमेंबर दैट बट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड इट रियली then it is closer to an ideal gas when there is lower density and lower density automatically implies lower pressure and higher temperature so you automatically covered all three and you understood something as well without just trying to remember it right low density is closer to a gas the higher the density the closer to a liquid it is extremely low density very close to an ideal gas okay now there are certain small laws which can be derived from the ideal uh, gas law PV is equal to nRT. This is the standard one. This is the one I prefer using. And generally, when you're given questions, you'll be given a certain number of moles. It's more likely that you'll be given moles than particles. So the first law is called Boyle's law. You don't need to remember the names for your entrance. You don't need to remember the names for your entrance examinations. But I think you do need to remember them for your NCERT and boards, especially CBSE. so boyle's law is simply that at constant temperature pressure is inversely proportional to volume we are talking about a particular quantity of gas so number of moles remains constant r is a constant boyle's law simply states that at constant temperature these three will be constant so p is inversely proportional to 1 by v right easily derivable then you have charles law which states that at constant pressure volume is proportional to temperature again if pressure is constant number of moles is constant r is constant v is proportional to the temperature then you have charles law of pressure which says that at constant volume yes you guessed it pressure is proportional to temperature again easily derivable and then you have avogadro's law which which is the same avogadro who named the constant and it says that at same temperature and pressure at the same temperature and pressure equal volume of all gases contain the equal number of moles that's true if t and p are same for all of them and v is the same for all of them r is obviously universal constant n is the same for all of them now the reason i show you all of them apart from obviously they might be important in your uh, board examinations is because historically these laws came first you could easily say why is boyle getting so much credit when it's easily derivable from this actually these four laws came first and from these four laws the ideal gas equation was deduced and some books and teachers teach it that way but that's of historical importance but i feel when you're trying to learn it's easier uh, when you're trying to learn it's best to follow a strategy of trying to remember the least amount of stuff and understand the most amount of stuff so you could either remember these four or you could remember this one and derive these four i feel the second is easier compared to the first right so this was the study of uh, the ideal gas equation and you can form a variety of different types of equations on this equation uh, you have a box of gas and you suddenly decrease the volume to 50% of its original value such that the temperature remains constant what is the new pressure and so on you could form an infinite number of questions from this law let's move on to proper kinetic theory now in kinetic theory of gases we will take a small box cubical box of gas and we will try to analyze the motion of the individual particles 
and compare them to the macroscopic properties which we know such as pressure volume and temperature so now we'll actually be studying what really is temperature um, the american scientist richard feynman uh, described it in a very nice way which i always find interesting to remember is this temperature is nothing but jiggling of molecules uh, if you have a cup of hot coffee for example all that means is that the coffee molecules are jiggling and vibrating faster than the molecules of the cup right and obviously the molecules at the edge of the cup will be vibrating faster and so they'll transfer some of the jiggling or some of the vibration to the coffee cup which makes the coffee cup hotter right when you're heating a boil, uh, heating a pot of water all that happens is the lower part of the uh, vessel it gets heated first so the molecules start vibrating rapidly because they start vibrating rapidly they make the water just above it the molecules they start vibrating rapidly and thus the whole water starts vibrating more rapidly and becomes hotter so temperature is really associated with the motion of the mo the molecules and the motion of the microscopic entities and we'll try to really analyze that now and see that the faster the microscopic entities are moving from the macroscopic point of view the hotter the body is and that that is the basic uh, core of kinetic theory of gases so first let's start with a few assumptions which we make in kinetic theory of gases and I, you might see these assumptions to be quite numerous but it's surprising how accurate the results are considering this we, that we make these assumptions the first assumption is that the molecules move randomly in all directions this is called being isotropic isotropic is a technical term and it just means no preferred direction you might have heard the a very common phrase the universe is isotropic all that means is from uh, the macroscopic point of view no particular direction is preferred in the universe as opposed to that a city is not isotropic there is a vertically downward direction where things fall so all directions are not equivalent in this case one particular consequence of this is that we are ignoring the effect of gravity because gravity would make to some extent all molecules move downward slightly but we are ignoring that and seeing all molecules move randomly in all directions no direction is preferred the second assumption is that the size of the molecules this goes for atoms as well i'm just going to write molecules but it goes for atoms as well is much smaller less than it means smaller if you have two less than signs that means much much smaller the size of the molecule is much much smaller then the average separation between molecules and this again is another way of saying that the density is quite small there are not a lot of molecules within any small unit of volume so the size of the volume is negligible compared to the average separation you will not have instances for example like this we will not consider instances like this where this might be the size of a molecule and this might be the separation and they are comparable if we are considering low density then the situations will be more like this where the size is negligible compared to the distance between them third is that the molecules exert no force on each other and on the walls except during collision if we assume that they exert no forces on the wall at all then obviously the pressure would have been zero because pressure is a measure of the force which is being applied on the wall right but we are not excluding collisions we are saying that the molecules do not attract each other and when a molecule is here it is not attracting the wall in any way when does it interact with the wall when it collides with the wall during that microscopic second we've already covered collisions before in mechanics during that microscopic second of collision it interacts with the wall which causes it to change its momentum so other than that no force will be exerted this seems like a surprising assumption to make because 
you would think that there is a lot of attraction between the molecules. A, that is true. But also we are considering very low densities, so even if the attraction is there, there are very few number of molecules attracting each other. Also, when you move on to the, there are some corrections you can make to the ideal gas which you'll see when you get to college. And that's called the Van der Waals real gas equation. And in that they can account for this pressure difference created due to attraction as well. So we have gone further than the ideal gas equation in terms of real progress made, but that's out of your course. The fourth assumption is, All collisions are perfectly elastic and instantaneous. Instantaneous is obviously assumed for any collisions that we studied, but we will assume all collisions are perfectly elastic. That means energy is conserved during those collisions. Right. Fifth assumption is that all molecules away Newton's laws. Now this might be the most surprising for you because we know that molecules do not obey Newton's laws. They are small quantum mechanical entities which follow the principles of quantum mechanics. However, again, if you take physics in college, during quantum mechanics, you're going to study that when you study huge numbers, the quantum mechanical properties average out to their corresponding classical mechanic counterparts. So it's not really an issue because we are studying a large number of molecules, not any single one. And the last and I guess the newest one to you, which you probably haven't heard before, is that the gas is in steady state. Now steady state can have many meanings. Generally when it comes to the state of a gas, steady state means the state is not changing with time. For example, if the temperature of a gas is constant and pressure is constant and volume is constant with time, then it's in steady state. Here we mean a slightly different steady state. We mean steady state with respect to the density and velocity distribution. So density and velocity distribution are independent of position direction and time. Right. So that means that there's no particular preference of direction. We've already stated that. But there is no particular preference of position, there is no center, a molecule is equally likely to be found anywhere and none of these distributions changes with time, they are all constant. One surprising consequence of this assumption is that you can completely ignore collisions of molecules with other molecules. Let's say you have two molecules, one went like this, one like this, they had a collision and they went like this. So you have a molecule which is changing its velocity from this direction to this direction. But given that the velocity distribution is independent of time, what that means is out of the nearly 10 to the power 23 molecules in this box, there must be some other molecule which was going in this direction and now because of collision is moving in this direction. So they basically, we can assume that they've swapped their velocities and did not really contribute to anything macroscopic. Right. So this really simplifies the calculations a lot. Using these assumptions, we will be able to calculate how the microscopic properties like kinetic energy relate to the macroscopic properties like temperature. We'll talk about that in the next video. Thank you.